Bloodstream listeners, Patrick here. Just before we kick off the episode, I wanted to let you know that we lost a titan in the bleeding disorders community this week, Donald Ziggy Douglas, who died very suddenly earlier this week. You're going to hear Amy and I talk about that toward the top of the show here. Um, But since we've recorded, I've had some communication with uh, Ziggy's wife, Lisa, and she sent a very sweet message to me. Uh, sort of in response to all the messages that she's been been receiving from the community. As as she said, it's been tremendous, but also overwhelming. And she wanted to communicate to the community and thought if she shared something with me, maybe that would be a good way to do it. So I'm going to read her words verbatim toward the end of the show on the other side of the interview with uh, Joe and Nathan. So stick around if you want to hear that. And now over to Natalie to kick us off. The Bloodstream Podcast is made possible by Takeda and is intended for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. Please consult with professionals before making any healthcare decisions. Having a bleeding disorder isn't partisan, um, and so we do our best to kind of make friends no matter who's in charge. That voice belongs to Joanna Gray, principal with the Artemis Policy Group, a boutique lobbying firm representing nonprofit organizations, including NHF, that promote health policies to benefit vulnerable people. She and NHF's vice president of public policy, Nathan Schaefer, join Amy and me for the interview later in the show to discuss what the election results could mean for the inherited bleeding disorders community, our policy and advocacy goals, impact on things like insurance coverage, important stuff, They're the experts, and they'll be on in just a little bit. But first, allow me to say hello and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast. I am your host, Patrick James Lynch, joined as I am each week by none other than my colleague, friend, and co-host, Amy Board. Hello, Amy. How are you? I'm well. I'm actually really looking forward to this episode. This has been like one that's been checked for a long time, you know, that we're going to talk what's what will come of all of these priorities in the bleeding disorder community with the election and all the things we have so much to discuss. So it's good. There's new things that are being like uh, percolated in the believe limited bloodstream world. So it's like, it's a really exciting time. And actually I should mention, like I'm just going to mention this right out of the gate. Like usually you get to say something, but I get to Uh, say something first this time. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. No, I I am <laughs> I'm excited to tease this. And I feel like actually as I'm sitting here, I feel like I should have written this out because um I don't know how to tease it without like giving it away. But we have a new project that's coming out specifically for women in the bleeding disorder community and women at large actually who struggle with menorrhagia and actually we we're, we're starting to develop that it's it's just women in general um, dealing with our menstrual cycles what they all mean and so women that are listening regardless of your you know um, your relationship to the community we'd like to ask you if you have any questions about your cycles about what is normal what is abnormal and what is disordered bleeding and as we've been as I've been a part of the creative development team putting this together I think that has been for me personally um, something that I don't even think I engage with of what is normal I think it's a you know we mm-hmm. Patrick <laughs> just between you we deal with this monthly and we don't we don't really ever talk about it it, it is a private thing it's a yeah. it's just something we deal with maybe you know our our power, our partners our spouses um, are involved in some way but really um, we don't talk about it and so it's a really fascinating question that there actually is a difference between the three there is normal abnormal and disordered menstrual bleeding and so we'd love to hear your questions um we ask you this all the time you guys but now you have to actually do it (laughs) what's the difference between abnormal and disordered maybe if we could get a little preview uh, on flow what is that difference it sounds similar patrick you you have to wait until it comes out to hear the answers Uh all right well fine to be completely and totally honest it's very it's a very it's very like a thin margin per se but basically it's about what treatment options are available to you you know i think um there are Mm. there are women that have significantly heavier flows that might not actually have a factor deficiency 
quote unquote disordered bleeding, but it is abnormal bleeding. And there there is, you know, a line between the two. And, you know, we just kind of want to, we want to normalize the conversation around it. And so we'd love your questions. If you have questions about it, if you've had questions in your life, you know, in your um, uh, growing up in adolescence, even, you know, going through menopause, we want to know your questions and we're going to... Uh, we have a team of, of folks that we're going to start conversations with and projects are gonna start coming out about this very topic for this community and we're, we're very excited. So make sure to reach out. You can reach out to me personally on social media. You can also find us at mailbag at bloodstreaminfo.org. Bloodstreammedia.com. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite reoccurring bits that we don't have to script. That's when Amy says the, the mailbag. If you're idea. listening to this and not watching the YouTube, I, I, I just, I would encourage you to go watch the YouTube because you can see my eyes looking at Patrick in the Zoom going bloodstreammedia.org. <laughs> like it's uh, very anchorman of like, if you put the question mark, he will read it. And I just have to let you get it out. And then, the, you know, it's the same routine every I time. I know, but I know. Now, you were... Uh, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com is where you can Com. send those questions or uh, if you find Amy or me but Amy's probably better uh, on social media you can send her send the questions her way as well and so long as we're plugging podcast stuff Bloodstream Journeys has a new episode out this week uh, Nicole Angelus who's actually been on Bloodstream Journeys before uh, talking about her VWD journey. Actually, this is very appropriate, Amy. This episode, it's framed as one woman's journey, but it really contains lessons that are appropriate for many people that we've heard from on persistence, advocacy, and courage. So this episode allows us to dive deeper into Nicole's interesting story that she's uh, very open with. Um, so that's the latest Bloodstream Journeys episode. You can find that through the website, bloodstreammedia.com. Click on the appropriate <laughs> thumbnail or there'll be a link in the program notes as well to Bloodstream And I have to say, Journeys. Bloodstream Journeys is, if you haven't checked it out yet, it is a great palate cleanser. I mean, it's just stories of our community, of people overcoming challenges. Um, it's, it's inspiring. You hear from folks that you don't hear from a lot. You know, here in the bleeding disorder community, we kind of have like the people that we hear from all the time. And mm -hmm. this is such a rich pipeline of people that share their stories it's it's beautifully done it's a great listen so anyway if you haven't checked that out we have a wealth of episodes for you to to discover uh and last bit of content business to touch on let's talk our mental health documentary uh that we screened at numerous places so far this year and thanks to our supporter Sanofi genzyme for all of that uh, we're in a bit of a holding pattern for 2021 screenings. We've had some inquiries, and for a bunch of boring reasons, we're in a bit of a holding pattern. So if you are interested, do let us know. You can email mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You can email info at believeltd.com. You can find Amy or me. And just let us know if you're interested, if you are um, a chapter leader, or if you are a member of a chapter organization, maybe ask your chapter leader or um, someone from the organization if they could include it in an upcoming meeting. That seems to be the way that it's most often being screened. But just to be explicit, since it is coming up, we are in a bit of a holding pattern. Uh, do let us know if you're interested and follow along at Let's Talk mh.com last week we talked about the blood feed calendar so just a quick reminder because you can only order them for like another couple weeks uh we have a free calendar bleeding disorders community calendar filled with goofy memes to just help make this bleeding disorders world we live in a little bit more palatable we've taken some of our favorite memes that we've put out through the blood feed channel the last few years and we've put them into a calendar that you can order for free at believe ltd dot com backslash calendar there are stickers where you can customize it to put down your infusion schedule or your next clinic date all kinds of great stuff that's specific for us believe ltd.com backslash calendar of course the bloodstream podcast as you know is made possible by our presenting sponsor Takeda, and for that we are quite grateful you can visit bleeding disorders.com to learn more about Takeda's commitment to and resources for the bleeding disorders community there are a lot of tabs. There are a lot of sub pages. I just click around because I want to know like what's going on. So that when I read these things, I'm current. There's so much stuff there. So really, so if you're looking for if, you, if you're looking for some resources, or if you're yes. just like, what what are these resources? I hear about them all the time on Bloodstream. What are they? Well, you can find out for yourself. <laughs> Bleedingdisorders.com, and for all their support of the Bloodstream podcast, we say thanks, Takeda. 
Okay, Amy, uh, we have our interview coming up with Joe and Nathan about policy and the election and our community and advocacy and all these important things. But, you know, when I think about community, when I think about advocacy, Donald Douglas Jr. is someone who comes to mind. And unfortunately, we learned, we're recording this on Tuesday, and we learned on Monday that uh, Donald, best known as Ziggy, passed away very suddenly. Uh, I believe it was Sunday night. Um this was stunning news to everyone, and if you're connected to the community through social media, you've seen an outpouring of love and sentiments for Ziggy. Um, you know, Amy, I know, actually, Amy, you broke the news to me and to our team yesterday while we were in a meeting. Yeah, I think if you if you never had the opportunity to meet Ziggy in person, um, if you're listening to this, yeah, I know you're engaged in your community, and there's someone in your community that's just this beacon, you know, whether they're affected personally or not, they're this um, source of joy and playfulness and um, compassionate service. They're a camp person, they're a chapter person, they're an HTC person. I mean, we are so, I think, blessed in the bleeding disorder community to have these people that mentor our kids, that inspire us as parents, and, um, you know, for a large chunk of the population, that person was Ziggy. And, um, you know, I, I texted you this morning, you know, I, I, I really wanted to do a tribute to Ziggy. I, I feel like um, I, I, it didn't sink in, to tell you the truth. In fact, I don't feel like it has. Um, yeah, no. I was lucky enough to, he was one of the first people I met in the community. He was a camp really? guy. He's a, he's oh, a, yeah, that makes and he's sense. like a camp dude. You know, there's like normal people and then there's like <laughs> camp people. Like Ziggy yeah. was a camp person. Yes. And he was, um, of course, you know, the Arizona Hemophilia Association holds uh, a summer camp conference for hemophilia camps um, globally, like global hemophilia summer camps get a training every year. And Ziggy for years and years and years was on that working group um, to put that conference together. So he was like, he was always a beacon and he was so gracious to me. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I 100, you know, like all things when you're like in your 20s, I, you just get thrown into it, like figure it out, young soul. <laughs> um, and he was just wonderful. And uh, he, he worked um, he worked in California. So he was a California camp guy. And then just recently, over the last several years, he was the executive director of the Hawaii chapter of NHF. And um, I was, when, when Ziggy got that job, I was the Colorado executive director. And we were a part of a very small um, group of executive directors that were housed underneath the National Hemophilia Foundation. And the seven of us were very, very close. <laughs> we mm. talked all the time. There was uh, like kind of a a brother sisterhood between the seven of us because it was such a demanding job and um the the amount of passion that one feels with such constraints of being you know a local nonprofit were just a very unique place to be in and ziggy was the most passionate hard-working soul i've ever seen and uh he loved those people in Hawaii. I mean, he had like, it was like a personal mission for him to make sure that they were served. And he had a hard job. You know, those families are scattered, um, you know, on all those islands. And I mean, it was right. very hard to, to do anything that felt like a community. And man, he, he had that ability to make everybody feel special, you know? And so... Yeah. And the ability yeah. to get a, an entire room of any size going, and, and especially yes. with kids, teenagers, any age, you know, good camp people, they can just walk into a room and on go take it over. And he had that. And I mean, that's actually my first memory of him was from an HFA meeting, maybe 2011. Um, and it was and it was him doing exactly what I just described, actually, which I then saw him do many times. But room full of teenagers that like when Ziggy was like, all right, it's time to start. You know, he threw some camp games out there, camp cheer, camp energy and it didn't take much. Everybody was bought in. I was like, who is this guy? I like this bald fellow with the goatee. Who is this yeah. guy? Um, He's a special human. I, I, did, I received a, a poem from Randy Curtis in, uh, in Northern California. It's a short one I'm going to read here. Always willing to step up, 
always happy to see you, always concerned about others, always will be missed. And, you know, it's that's real simple, but I think it captures uh, the spirit really well. You know, he was an optimistic, energy, an elevating, positive, concerned member of this community, and, um, and we're going to miss him. There's no replacing. There's no... Mm-hmm silver lining this is you know this is this is hard and this is sad and i'm i feel for his family and uh for all of his his dear dear friends i mean we're all Mm -hmm. i think the whole community is hurting but for those in particular for whom he was a part of their intimate circle i'm thinking about them um this week and ziggy thank you for everything that you gave to this community um your reputation is going to well outlast your time here on earth you are a beacon of light, and uh, I think there'll be more than one occasion in the future when I am in a jam and feeling a little blech about things, and I think, you know, Ziggy would Ziggy would bring it right now, and I, uh, I'm i going to think in advance for those. So um, with that, let us, Amy, take a quick break, and then we'll be back with the interview with Joe and Nathan. Patrick and I are here with Joanna Gray, a principal lobbyist representing nonprofit organizations, including the National Hemophilia Foundation and Nathan Schaefer, NHF's vice president of public policy. I personally have wanted to interview you guys for so long. Welcome to the podcast, dear friends, colleagues. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. We're excited to be here. There's so much to talk about, about I know. PC and all the craziness. Yeah, I know. We can't wait to dive into it. Um, before we start, I'd love to, you know, I, I feel like our listeners and the majority of the community know you guys. They know of you. They've been with you for a while. But I think um, your backgrounds are actually important. And I don't know if very many people know your background. So just real quick, Joe, I'd love to get some of your background and how long you've been working for the bleeding disorder community, because I think that's so interesting. Well, thanks so much, Amy. Um, Yeah, so I have been one of NHF's um, federal policy advisors or lobbyists in D.C. since 2007, so 13 or almost 14 years. Um, My partner is Alan Riker, who has worked with the hemophilia community since the late 80s. Um, We are the dynamic duo representing NHF in D.C., Um, and I have been doing lobbying and health policy work for, I guess, 15 years now. Um, and NHF is my, you know, my one true love. So I'm, I'm really glad to, um, to be able to work with, with such wonderful people and on behalf of a community where the advocacy is so strong. It's really inspiring. I remember when I started uh, my chapter work and like starting to get into advocacy, it really, it like blew my mind that you guys have been in the community and represented us for so long. You have such a history and you know so many of the community members and staff personally. So anyway, you're like one of the family, Joe. Oh, thanks, man. (laughs) (laughs) And Nathan, I love your path to this community too. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got, uh, how you came to work for NHF. Sure. So my background is in HIV and AIDS public policy and advocacy. I moved to New York City 12 and a half years ago to work for an organization called Gay Men's Health Crisis. It was the first HIV service organization in the world. And I was the director of public policy. And one of our policy priorities was challenging the FDA on the blood donation policy for men who have sex with men. You're not going to do any work in that sort of advocacy arena without coming into contact with the bleeding disorders community. And this was over 10 and a half years ago, but I remember learning about the history of HIV within the hemophilia community. And then I learned about the success of passing the Ricky Ray Act, where the federal government authorized compassionate payments to people who contracted HIV through blood transfusions in the 80s and early 90s. And I remember thinking to myself, wait a minute, how many people are in this community? There's only 20,000 people that have hemophilia in the United States. Yet there was at the time 1.2 million people living with HIV in the United States. So for such a small, rare disorder, the impact of the advocacy was immediately profoundly impressive to me. And fast forward four months down the road from meeting the hemophilia world at GMHT, we hired Ellen Riker, 
and later Joanna worked with us too, because we were just so impressed with the history of the advocacy. So um, fast forward to a few years ago and I had a chance to come on board. So I've been with NHF since early 2016 and still am very, very impressed by the advocacy roots, by the passion and by the success of the community broadly. It's just been an amazing community to get to know and um, to work with. So it, it has been a, a, a really fun journey so far. Wait a minute. So you knew Ellen and Joe before you came to work for NHF? I didn't even know that. We're friends. We like had cocktails. I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. We used to lobby on some pretty interesting issues that we can talk to you about over cocktails. You know, yeah, next time we there's, can't there's wait. Some good stories there. There's some good stories there. But yeah, yeah we been, had fun. Been many years. I might have to sneak some microphones into that conversation, but we'll get to that later. I was later. about to say, I was like, uh, let's second podcast that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cocktails can be, you're welcome to have cocktails, but we're going to be second podcasting it. So uh, uh, a lot's happened in just the last several days. And let's start with probably the, the biggest headline, which is the presidential election. So Joanna, I'm just going to leave it real broad to let you give us your take on the presidential election, what we've learned and what that has you thinking about. Yeah. So, you know, it's not all quite definite yet. There are still a couple states who are still counting votes and recounts and, and all that. But I guess it was Saturday when um, basically every news organization agreed that president elect Joe Biden had enough electoral votes from the states that were in to be, you know, elected as the president elect. Um, and, you know, we'll talk, I think, in a little bit about kind of Congress and the election and, and what happened there. But I think what's most important for the community is we think about the transition from a Trump administration to a Biden administration um, in January is so much of healthcare policy is handled by the administration on a regulatory level. Um, and folks who have been around advocacy in the community know that we had did a ton when Congress was trying to repeal and replace the ACA, the Affordable Care Act back in 2017. Um, NHF has also been really busy on the regulatory level over the last four years. It's, it's like not as sexy as coming to the Hill. It's, you know, reading complicated regulations and writing comment letters, um, sure. which is something that I think is pretty fun, but I'm, and I know Amy does, but I don't know that anybody else really, yeah. really gets yeah. into that. A very specific, um, sliver of folk. kind of person yeah <laughs> for sure um but so the kind of switch between president trump to president biden will have a big impact on the healthcare policy issues that we care about and coverage and implementation of the aca so um that's the first place where my mind goes and what about you nate where, where did you find your your head going as the results came in on saturday and in the few days that have transpired since well i didn't really have a, I was just trying to navigate the sidewalk safely in New York City. Like people, you would have thought we just won World War III. Like people were, it was nuts to be in New York City on Saturday and Sunday. But my thoughts, um, first of all, you have to acknowledge we had record turnout. More people voted in this presidential election than ever before. And while the popular vote seems to be quite decisive, I think it's what between like four and five million more votes for President-elect Biden, um, and that is significant, but it also underscores that we still have a very divided nation. That's almost half of the country that voted for a candidate who did not win. And many of uh, President Trump's supporters are vehement about their support. And we can't ignore that we now have an opportunity or probably more um, appropriately considered a challenge to rectify our differences and figure out how we can come together, get behind the president elect and the vice president elect. And let's not leave with the fact that we now have the first female black South Indian vice president elect in the country, which, from my personal vantage point is hugely significant. Um, but I, I I echo everything Joanna said, and I know that there's still a little bit of things that we need to sort of iron out before we can have a definitive resolution. But at the same time, we can't ignore that a lot of people are still going to be very upset 
and we have to figure out how to move forward in respectful and collegial ways as we're trying to figure out the future of healthcare, um, regulation, you name it. And I think Nathan makes a great point. And we know just even within our community, we have a wide spectrum of political beliefs. And um, I think as a community, we also have friends on both sides of the aisle, you know, from both parties on the federal and state level. And, you know, having a bleeding disorder isn't partisan. Um, and so I think Nathan makes a great point that you know, as, as your kind of policy team, um, one of the policy teams that works on behalf of the community, we do our best to kind of make friends, no matter who's in charge, um, because we know that that we'll have support in, in on both sides. You know, and Republicans were huge to passing the Ricky Ray bill and funding it, you know, back in the 90s. And so it's not like, well, you know, we're, we're better off with one president than another. The Ricky Ray Act, when it passed in the 90s, was the bill that had, the only bill that had more co-sponsorship than the Ricky Ray Act was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So that speaks to the community's history and ability to work across the aisle and to secure um, champions regardless of their political persuasion. Wow. Give me goosebumps. <laughs> me too. OMG. <laughs> so looking, so now, so um, moving on to the chambers where there's there's some razzle dazzle there as well. Um, I, we'll go to the house first, which seems to be settling. Um, it looks like um, the house is going to regain a democratic majority, but they lost some seats. How is that going to affect policy conversations going forward, if all? Yeah, I think that, um, so as of now, um, the GOP picked up five seats, but the Dems retain control. And I think there are like five or six seats that are where they're still counting votes. So okay. that'll settle to your point, Amy, um, I think in the next couple of days. I don't know that it really changes things. Um, you know, the, the way the rules are set up for how Congress functions, the majority in the House has a lot of power. And you know, the more cushion the majority has, the more wiggle room on any particular vote that a member could, could you know, not hang with the party, but, but go on the other side. So it's a little bit trickier. Um, Nancy Pelosi is running for speaker again. Um, and at least as of now, it seems like she's likely to be elected again um, as speaker. And so I would expect on the House side, things will be more or less the same, though, um, there are changes in some committee chairs and some committee ranking members due to retirements and members who've lost. So that has more influence on which bills the House Energy and Commerce Committee, for example, will pick up um, because there'll be a new ranking member next year. Do you know if anybody's running against Pelosi and if they've like put their name in the ring? I don't think anybody has yet. Okay. Um, you know, in the last week, Democrats have, have started the regular game of sniping at each other about, you know, we should be more left, we should be more center. Um, whose fault is it that some members lost? There's a lot happening on Twitter for those who, who want to get into the muck. But um, I, I would guess someone might throw their hat in the ring. But um, Speaker Pelosi has, has done a great job now for many years kind of centralizing her own power, for lack of a better word. So I would be surprised if she weren't reelected. And what about in the Senate? That, too, is still up in the air. Um, what, can you explain what is happening in the in the Senate chamber? There's some kind of interesting and ongoing uh, into 2021 considerations there. Yeah, that's what gets Amy's jazz hands. Yeah, I think jazz the razzle dazzle yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, comes in the Senate. And that's because um, so there were two elections in the Senate. There was a special election and a kind of regular one. Um, and in both cases, the, the winner did not get more than 50% of the vote, which triggers two runoff elections um, that will be in January. And, you know, there, there are only 100 Senate seats. So any one Senate race gets a lot of attention. But this one, I think, will be particularly nutty for our friends down in Georgia, um, because the winner will likely determine the party control of the Senate. So right now it's 48 Dems to 50 Republicans with these two kind of outstanding. So if the Democratic candidates were to win both elections in January, then as vice president, um, Vice President Harris is as the president of the Senate could cast a tie breaking vote. So everything shifts to 
Democratic control. Um, if not, then it would stay within Republican control. So I think kind of all eyes on on Georgia for the next two months or so. Georgia, the fact that Georgia still hasn't been called and is leaning towards a Democratic uh, presidential election result is astounding to me. And um, it has to be acknowledged that Stacey Abrams seems to have had a decisive impact on the political persuasion of voters in the state of Georgia. I'd never in a million years would think that it is possible that they would be sending potentially two Democratic senators to the U.S. Senate. And keep in mind, senators serve terms of six years. So that's not something that's going to change even in the next midterm election in the event that it would happen. Either way, though, in the Senate, let's say even both of those um, states go uh, to the Republican candidates, the narrow um, majority is it. It's even smaller, which means it's easier to get a um, it, to get a uh, co coalescing around a um, vote if you have. Let's just talk about the Affordable Care Act from 2017, right? Because two of the Republicans who were vociferous advocates for the Affordable Care Act were Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, both of whom are very moderate Republicans who are both been reelected to the Senate. So if you consider those votes just those alone, and you already have two Republicans going into those deliberations, from a defensive standpoint of the critical provisions of the Affordable Care Act, we're in an even better position in 2020 than we would have been in 2017. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you agree, Absolutely, Joel? yeah. Just a um, Civics 101, just for anyone who's not sure, what is a runoff? Another election? All right. I, okay. dun, dun, dun. Okay. Is this a trick? Is, is this a trick question? So no, they basically I just want to. You know, it all, it just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a runoff yeah. election. So basically, the whole thing happens again. Um, because you know, the, the margin was votes. so small, based on like a law that each state has. If it's you know below a certain percentage, you have to basically you have to do it again. Right. So in Georgia, it's fifty percent. Um, so in one case, they were super, super close. Um, and the winner did not get over 50%. Um, in the special election, there were actually a bunch of candidates, and so the, the vote was diluted further. Um, so it's, it's like whoever voted last time doesn't count. It, it, it start, they start over at zero each, um, and it's another kind of regular election. Day. I really I want a Wikipedia runoff and see if it just says another election. That makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah, I know it's gonna be a very, very fancy thing. <laughs> I was like, um, I don't know, another race, same, same thing, same verse, same as the first. Like, I, I, don't know. I just want to make sure everyone But what'll knew. be interesting, <laughs> but what'll be interesting is, you know, to Nathan's point. Um, millions and millions and millions more people voted this presidential election. The last midterm election, there were tons more people who voted than the election before. But a runoff election, off cycle without everything else going along with it, you know, it'll really come down to, you know, who can turn out all the voters, which is just different in January than it is in November when, you know, so there's so much attention to it. So I, I assume that's what both the candidates, um, the national parties, and the nonprofits like Stacey Abrams that Nathan mentioned will all be working on. And runoffs can be controversial because they're it's expensive to host an election. So let me give you an example. A few years ago here in New York City, there's a uh, position called the public advocate. And it's a citywide position and anyone can run for it. It's typically people who have term limited out of serving in the city council. A few years ago, there had to be a runoff because the candidates were so close that um, the law determined that they had to have a runoff. And I think the actual cost of the election was about $4 million. And again, this is in New York City, which we have 8 million people, it's, it's a lot. But the Office of the Public Advocate, their overall budget that they would oversee on an annual basis was less than $1 million. So New Yorkers were critical of the runoff saying, this is a waste of money if we're spending this much for an office that only oversees this amount of responsibilities. I'm just giving that as context because I do not think we should not have a runoff in the state of Georgia to have the outcome of the Senate to be reliant on two runoffs in a controversial state. That is 
hugely, hugely important, but I just want your listeners to know that sometimes there's controversy about whether or not a runoff is a worthwhile investment of public resources. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great example as to why it is uh, controversial. And that's a whole, I mean, I guess that gets into public funding of elections in a whole nother topic, perhaps for another day. But the ACA came up before, and I want to kind of stay on that, transitioning slightly over to the Supreme Court. So we knew as soon as Justice Ginsburg died, there was quickly stories about the ACA coming back in front of the Supreme Court and perhaps her replacement being um, brought onto the bench in time for that hearing, which has in fact now happened and those hearings have started. We're recording this on Wednesday just before 3 p.m. Eastern. So by the time listeners hear this, there might be some more information out. But as of right now, Joanna, where do things stand in the Supreme Court with the challenge to the ACA? Sure. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, we have plenty for us to talk about. Um, so the oral argument in the case that is, that is now called California v. Texas was yesterday in the Supreme Court, um, and it's public. You can read the, um, the transcript, and there have been about a million articles written about it, and I know that that will continue. Um, and I suspect you've covered the lawsuit before for your listeners. Is it helpful for me to spend like 30 seconds on what the case is about? Absolutely, because yes. there's been twists and turns, okay. and so please do. Yes. Sure, 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 sure. I don't have my like snazzy charts and flow, you know, flow charts, but um, I'll, sure. I'll wing it. So. <laughs> I'll wing it. <laughs> so um, to understand this case, you kind of have to go back in time. So one of the first challenges to the Supreme, or uh, to the Affordable Care Act, excuse me, that made it to the Supreme Court asked the question of if the individual mandate, the requirement that you buy insurance or pay a penalty was constitutional. Um, It was all this stuff about broccoli. Like can Congress pass a law that makes you eat your broccoli? Um, And what the Supreme Court said was, well, no, they can't make you eat your broccoli, but they can impose a tax penalty if you don't. They can't make you buy insurance, but if you don't, they can charge you a tax penalty. Flash forward to 2017 in the tax reform law that Congress passed um, in December of that year, they basically removed the penalty for the individual mandate. So it still says you have to have health insurance. And it still says if you don't have health insurance, you pay a penalty. But what's weird is it doesn't say like $500 now, it says zero. So the penalty, the penalty you pay is $0. Then in 2018, um, 20 state attorneys general um, sued on behalf of a couple of people from Texas saying, well, the Supreme Court said the mandate's okay if it's a tax. There isn't really a tax penalty anymore. Therefore, the mandate isn't constitutional. And basically, the entirety of the ACA um, rests on the individual mandate. So if the mandate goes away, the whole law has to go away. And so that has been kind of the question over the last two years as the case has made its way through the legal system. So that brings us to this week, um, where the Supreme Court is really, this all turns on two issues. One is called standing. So do those couple of people in Texas, um, have they been harmed by the individual mandate? by the ACA and the requirement without the penalty? Do they have standing to file the lawsuit in the first place? Um, You know, part of me thinks if the Supreme Court didn't think they had standing, they didn't have to take the case in the first place. They could have, they could have declined it. And so, well, there were a lot of questions in the oral argument yesterday about standing. Um, I would be surprised if they, if they ruled on that count. You know, I should say this is all super grain of salt, mountain of salt. You know, I think lots of people try to read tea leaves and it's funny because I'll talk about the second issue in just a sec. Um, Some of the justices were pretty clear about what they were thinking about this case, but you never know until the the final decision comes out. Um, And so the second issue is called severability. And the question is, say the individual mandate is unconstitutional, how much of the rest of the law can't be separated, can't be severed from it? Um, and so that's what most of the questioning was about. So it's like, well, the individual mandate, you know, the people who filed the original lawsuit said the individual mandate is key to the entire 2000 page mega law that includes a whole ton of things in it. Um, and some of the Supreme Court justices seemed pretty skeptical of that because 
let's be honest, the mandate was basically removed three years ago and the law still stands, everything is fine. And so some of the more conservative justices even said that you, you're saying this is at the heart of it, but clearly it's not. Um, I think conservative judges also are often conservative in their interpretation. And so would they, for some of them to say the mandate can't be severed and the whole law has to, has to fall, um, folks think it's pretty unlikely. So that was a very long way of saying um, that the main question about severability based on what was said in oral argument, it does not seem as though the justices are inclined to throw out the entire ACA, which I think was our biggest nightmare, um, nor do they seem terribly convinced that even like pre-existing condition protections, like other stuff that seems more closely related to the mandate, they didn't really seem convinced of that as well. So, so the tea leaf readers um, now think that what's likeliest um, is that they will say the individual mandate is unconstitutional and kind of leave it there, but say that it can be separated from the rest of the law, which basically is status quo. So it could be we've had two years of anxiety by community members, lots of advocacy, um, NHS signed on to an amicus brief with a bunch of other patient advocacy groups talking about the importance of the ACA. You know, a million lawyers, ours, you know, and we'll be back at status quo. Um, but again, you know, that's me saying all of this as of, you know, 3 p.m. on November 11th, you know, a lot more to come on that. I hope that made sense. That that was fantastic. Thank you very much. That was okay. super clear, and I very much <laughs> okay, appreciate good. it. So, good, so I want to I want to follow that line. Then let's let's assume for a moment that the tea leaves that we're interpreting stand. That comments like uh, I think uh, Justice Scalia made a comment about it being deja vu all over again because there are similar challenges that the Supreme Court has already ruled on. Justice Kavanaugh was pretty clear about where he stood, and there's precedent prior to this case that yeah. that he may vote in that way. And of course, Chief, Chief Justice Roberts. Has has previously voted in favor of protecting the Affordable Care Act. So let's say things stay in the status quo place. Nathan, for NHF going into 2021, what does that mean specifically to the ACA? What what are what is NHF and, and the policy folks that you work with, what are you talking about when it comes to our advocacy efforts, Washington days, state days, and our general policy goals related to the ACA? I would say um, a couple of things. First of all, Give people the opportunity to surprise you because you just mentioned Justice Roberts and he has um, ruled in very surprising decisions, frankly. And so I think even with a brand new justice, you can't assume that they aren't going to make the right call on behalf of vulnerable populations across this country. What this means for what we need to do going into Washington days, which by the way is gonna be March 1st to the 5th, fully virtual, excited about that, more to come. Um, our job will be similar to what it has been in past years, and that is to educate members of Congress about the critical provisions that protect our patients. Uh, caring for a bleeding disorder is incredibly expensive. Uh, protections from pre-existing conditions are really important to our community. So it will be a matter of going in with those same messages and with the same stories to convey just how complicated and expensive it is to care for a bleeding disorder. But keep in mind, there are going to be new members of Congress, there's going to be new senators, and they may not know much about bleeding disorders. I think about offices like Senator Susan Collins. The families that go in to meet with her on Washington days, she has met with them many, many years prior. And I like to believe that is part of why she has been a staunch advocate on behalf of the patient protections inherent within the Affordable Care Act. But I can't say that for the brand new senators from Arizona, Colorado, and Alabama, right? They, they hopefully might know something, but um, our task going forward is going to continue to raise awareness and educate about the complexity of caring for a bleeding disorder. And that trickles down to the state level as well. Um, and we are planning to do as much virtual state 
advocacy as we can. I'm hopeful that state legislatures will be able to meet with people in person at some point in 2021, but I don't anticipate we're going to be sponsoring an in-person state advocacy day in the first half of the new year as we have in years past. But there's still ways that we can communicate with um, elected officials social media interactions with elected officials are even more critical right now when we can't meet face to face. So to answer your question broadly, it's going to be the same as what we've done in the past few years, which is to say, this is what's really important to our community. And this is what could happen in the event that these patient protections don't remain. To echo Nathan's point, I mean, there's going to be more than 60 new members of Congress next year. Um, it, and lots of new staff, you know. Um, so I think kind of going back to Bleeding Disorders 101 is going to be key. We, we kind of focus on that the first Washington days of the new Congress. Um, the other thing I'll mention is, you know, the ACA remaining law is, I think, critically important. But we know there's lots and lots of insurance barriers that people still face. And so, and there are lots of ways, frankly, that the ACA has been eroded over the last four years under President Trump. And so I think that y'all have talked about the 100 days agenda, um, which is something that we have signed off on with like 30 something other leading national patient advocacy groups. Um, so we have a pretty clear the first 100 days of the new Congress and now a Biden administration, here are the ways to undo um, really negative policies that have been enacted um, to try and kind of bring the ACA back to where it was four years ago. Um, I know y'all have also talked about accumulator adjusters. Like there are still so many issues, even with the ACA remaining law. And so I think, I think somebody something... is a Bloodstream podcast listener. That's what I'm starting I mean, to learn here. I don't once, know. once or twice follow you guys on Twitter. I know what's up. Um, <laughs> hey. um, but yeah, I mean, so I think whenever I talk about the ACA to our folks, it's always like really important. Let's understand what was, what did the law do pros and cons, but we know it's not perfect and there's still plenty of stuff, um, plenty of policies that we need to try and pursue to make it work better for our folks. Amy, I know we're going to move um, along. I just want to ask one quick um, context-related question of you, Joanna. Uh, to the point made uh, that Nathan made about we won't have in-person advocacy likely for the first half of the year. Federal and state days will be virtual. Given that you you work with a number of different um, health communities, is that kind of the case for other health communities and their advocacy efforts, or are we uh, different in any way, or is that just kind of what everyone's facing next year? Yeah, I think the shift to virtual advocacy, we all kind of figured out together, um, you know, over the spring. And um, I don't know a single group doing anything in person on Capitol Hill. I mean, Capitol Hill is closed to outside folks as of March. Um, mm. And so I think we're a ways away from sitting in one of those super tiny <laughs> congressional offices where you jam a bunch of people in. So we've been doing lots of meetings like this on Zoom, which has worked really well um, with both members and staff. So it's still, it's, it's still, um, it's not as, you know, in person, obviously, virtual has its own hiccups, but um, I think we'll have a great Washington day by Zoom this year. I agree. It might not be the feeling, you know, that majestic, you know, democracy. Right. Every time I go, I'm like, democracy, man. I mean, it just, <laughs> just like, oh, Good it's use so of majestic, powerful. Amy. I know, but I do feel like this year, you know, as with all, you know, election years, this is a, you know, it's so incredibly important and maybe more people will be able to go that wouldn't be able to, you know, afford the travel right. or, you know, um, take a day off of work or something like that. So that's exciting. Um, moving on to priorities for the bleeding disorder community. Where are we with some of these priorities? I know so many folks that listen are active advocates, so they they know what the SNF bill is, you know, they know that we have Medicaid stuff, you know, where, where are all those things now? And in particular, um, here towards the end of the year, you know, going into uh, January, where do we stand right now here at the end of the year? Well, I can maybe start with the SNF bill, and then Nathan, do you want to talk about a pro after that? Sure. Um, so the Smith bill, we were thrilled after lots of, of years of work behind the scenes to have bipartisan bills introduced in the House and Senate this year. 
Um, we are still working and, and kind of fingers crossed that the bills might become enacted in the lame duck session of Congress, um, which is just the session between the election and when the new Congress starts. You know, and I actually have no idea why it's called the lame duck session. I was about can, to say, I was we like, can look that so... up. We should look that up on Wikipedia with runoff and yeah, see, 100%. like, make a glossary of, like, you know. <laughs> I can see Patrick doing it right now. I can look at it and Googling. (laughs) Yeah, I'll get us something. Okay, okay, cool. I'll keep going. Um, So um, the current funding for the federal government runs out a month from today on December 11th, which means, and and Nathan will talk in a second about our priorities there, but um, Congress is going to have to pass another big bill. Um, and the thought is that the Medicare policy staff will ride along with that. We are working with our champions to have our SNF bill ride along with that as well. Um, if it doesn't happen this year, it'll have to be reintroduced for the new Congress. When you switch to a new Congress, every bill has to be reintroduced. Um, and so we will work with the, our champions and the folks who have co-sponsored the bills already to be original sponsors, and then you kind of start over on building support and um, hoping for enactment, if, if not this year, then um, in the new Congress next year. And a uh, quick overview of what the SNF bill is about, the skilled nursing facility bill. The SNF bill seeks to um, facilitate access to skilled nursing facilities for people with bleeding disorders who are Medicare beneficiaries. So the way Medicare payment rules are set now, it's really hard for our folks to access SNF. Um, because they are not allowed to bill separately for factor or other bleeding disorders treatments the way that other types of care settings can in Medicare. Um, So we are trying to ride precedence in a couple different ways to basically add bleeding disorders treatments to um, existing exemptions so that it'll be easier for folks to access. This is something, you know, shout out to any HTC social workers or nurses who might be listening to this because they have been pleasantly relentless <laughs> with us <laughs> over the last several years about how big an issue this is for them because they're the folks who have yeah. patients that they they're trying to help navigate and they are the nicest people and you also really don't want to piss them off so i'm oh. glad that we now have the bill introduced and we are doing our best um to get it enacted this year every single hemophilia a patient is nodding their head up and down you do not <laughs> want to disappoint them it's like a thing yeah <laughs> yeah well, it's, you, we need to acknowledge that the bill is bipartisan. It's got representation from Democrats and Republicans. And one of the things that Joanna did earlier this year, and this was actually no easy feat, it might not sound like it, but to get the bill introduced with bipartisan co-sponsorship, when you've got lead sponsors from both sides of the aisle, that just During sets you up. During the impeachment. Gun. During the impeachment yeah. debate in the Senate, that was just this year. That was yeah. still in 2020. Can oh you my even... gosh, that was this year. It's impossible. I know. I'm sorry, Nathan. I interrupted you. No, no, I, no. You're right. And the bill was in the Senate side was literally introduced on Tuesday at 5 p.m. before Wednesday Washington days commenced. Like, oh. It was. It was. But we. But she made it happen. So. Thank That's you. That's cool. Um, well, I'll and I will briefly. say, as someone who has attended Washington Days this year, learned about the sniff bill there, went into the rooms based on the knowledge I learned just from be- I had no idea about the sniff bill before. And as has been my experience with Washington Days the last however many years, you go, you learn, and you're ready. Like, I go every year not really knowing what the... Uh, the initiatives are, but the training is very, it's comprehensive, but not overly so. So you're like, all right, I now understand this well enough to go into these rooms and tell other people about it. So that's a credit to the work that you, that NHF does and Joe, that you and Ellen do. Uh, So I just wanted to point that out that thank you for that great work. And um, I wasn't fully aware of just how, like, I guess I knew the impeachment was going on during that time, but I didn't put all the pieces together, just how difficult it must have been to properly and appropriately set up set us all up for success during that so kudos to you for that and to nhf as well well that's very sweet it's been a long year in dc that's all i'll say speaking of cocktails <laughs> yeah 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 um nathan do you want to talk about funding that was our other kind of big watch yeah issue. sure so um 
First of all, I'm glad to hear that you found the training beneficial and felt comfortable going up on the hill with the talking points that we armed you with. But for anybody who hasn't been to Washington Days, don't worry about being an expert on whatever we're going to be talking about. You come to Washington Days to share your story and share what your family has gone through. And if you are in a meeting and someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer, that is fine. Just say you don't know and we'll figure out how to get the information back to them. Like you, you're just there to share your story. We will do our best to make you as confident as possible going up on the hill. And when you do, one of the other things you will talk about is federal appropriations for bleeding disorder programs, which is always a priority at Washington Days. There is funding that goes to support the National Network of Hemophilia Treatment Centers. There is funding that supports research at the National Institutes of Health that can better uh, inform our government's uh, ability to care for people with bleeding disorders. And every year we go and ask for the funding to at least be flat. Flat funding is not a bad thing. And flat means same. It's just the same line, the same amount as it was in the past year. The good news for our uh, programs is that uh, the House acted much earlier this year, the Senate just did, but in both of them, there is reference to the importance of the programs from the appropriators. Those are the members of Congress that sit on the Appropriations Committee. So when you hear report language, what that means is not only does the committee say, look, we want to fund these programs at this amount, but they will take it a step further and insert, it's rarely more than a paragraph that says, these are the reasons why these programs are important to the committees that are authorizing the funding for them. That gives you a better position in order to defend those funding amounts in the event that future negotiations bring them into question, which frankly happens all the time. The legislative process is very, very complicated. There is a slight chance we could see some additional funding trickle down to support bleeding disorder programs, but the increase of um, research dollars that was authorized to the NIH, and this is really just on the House side, um, was mostly COVID related. So we will see as uh, things, as things uh, pan out exactly what that will look like. But I guess the general takeaway on appropriations is, at least to date, it's good news that we're not going to be cut in the next year. Um, I want to start. So as I'm looking at our time, I want to start giving people a sense of where that they where they can be engaging as we go forward. As we've discussed a couple few times now, it's going to be a largely virtual, at least first half of 2021. But all of the policy initiatives and the things that we need to be advocating for as a community, those haven't become less important just because the circumstances that we're operating within have changed. So what would each of you advise people to do to stay engaged? Where are the best places that they can be going or checking in with? Uh, what, what advice would you give whoever would like to kind of take that first? I would say um, stay engaged with your chapter and with your HTC. If there are priorities that are coming from the national organizations that are going to inform advocacy opportunities at the state and local level, your best way to be informed about that is to be connected with your chapter and or your HTC. Um, we have a new platform that many chapters are going to be um, engaging with. It's called Phone to Action, and it gives people virtual opportunities to, co to connect with their elected officials at the federal, state, and local level. It's really neat. Stay tuned. A lot of chapters are going to be launching their own state-specific Phone to Action platform. So I think that cool. is the best way to stay engaged. You also should absolutely follow both NHF and HFA on Facebook, Twitter. Um, we, we post a lot on social media when there are advocacy opportunities. Remember, Washington Days is going to be March 1st to the 5th. Registration for that will be opening up very soon. So um, that's probably, if you register for Washington Days, that's going to be your best bet for staying in touch with the national organizations about opportunities. Great, great information. Thank you. Joe, anything you'd like to add to that? Well, no, you took all the good ones. Um, okay. I guess the only thing um, I guess the only thing I'll add is is kind of echoing where you started your question. Um, 
which is like, I think people have been so focused on politics and on policy this year. And there's been so much enthusiasm um, around that. And I want people to keep, you know, whether you're happy with what happened last week or not, um, your voice still matters. And I think Nathan just rattled off lots of ways that you can participate in advocacy on behalf of the community. Um, you know, I hope everyone listening voted last week, um, but there's so much more that you can do. And it really, really, really matters. Like as we've seen from the last week, you know, elections are turning on like shockingly small margins. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Nathan told told stories. We have, we know there are cases where individual advocates have made a connection that has made a difference for our community. And um, as I said at the beginning, like, you know, you slash we are the best of the best. Like I would go into any room with any policymaker with um, a bleeding disorders advocate or family on any issue ever, you know, just like superstars. Um, So I just hope that folks will keep all of their enthusiasm um, and bring it into next year. Cause I don't know, you know, we couldn't have predicted what this year has been like I, you know, knock on Ikea desk next year is much calmer. Uh, I don't know if it's wood. I hope it's wood. <laughs> I got a wood one. I'll, I'll help know, us out. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but whatever happens next year, we're going to need everybody to, to hang together. So I hope folks will join us. Well, the last thing that that I'll say is that, of course, we try to keep a, a good ear to the ground, finger on the pulse, and, and make announcements here through Bloodstream. Um, but as things like the opening for registering for Washington Days comes up, as more information about other initiatives is made available, of course, feel free to ping Amy or I. And if there's a reason for us to come back and do another one of these, we will do that as well. But if it's as simple as, hey, here's a quick announcement, just let us know that too. And, and we'll do everything we can, especially in this digital virtual heavy era that we're in and will continue to be in. Um, to support and amplify these very important efforts and to combat the uh, the the little bit of complacency that may set in in this post-election phase. So message received there. And Patrick, I'm going to one-up you. I would like to invite both of you back on the podcast next year after some of the Washington Day's insanity, and we'll do a recap. Yes. Woo-hoo. <laughs> And maybe we'll get into some state stuff, which is, you know, also fun and dicey. Mm, state. <laughs> love the states everybody's different uh joanna gray nathan schaefer thank you so much for joining us this was really informative i hope it's helped people uh process some of this post elections you know, kerfuffle that's at least in my head um and giving people places that they can go for ongoing vital information so thanks for taking the hour today to sit down with us uh, thanks my for pleasure me. thank you for having us Again, I just want to thank Joanna Gray and Nathan Schaefer for being with us and to encourage everybody to stay engaged uh, through this process. Um, As you well know, it's not over and um, things change on the fly, Patrick. They change on the fly. (laughs) So some of the best ways that you can stay engaged is to follow, of course, uh, the National Hemophilia Foundation on their social channels. And I would say um, subscribe to their emails. Make sure that you get on their emails. If you go to hemophilia.org and look in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a little uh, orange button, rather, that says subscribe. Click that and make sure that you are subscribed and any call to actions will come through there. And um, here we go onward. It's uh, it's a part of our democracy, and I think it's so important that we share what it's like, our lived-in experience um, for our decision makers. So this is this is something that we hold really dear. Bloodstream listeners, as I mentioned in the cold open. I received a message from Donald Ziggy Douglas's wife, Lisa, in response to all of the support and love that's been shared since news of Ziggy's death reached the Bleeding Disorders community, and I'm going to share her words with you right now. Mahalo for the video with such kind words. He loved you all. I have not been able to catch up on all the amazing posts and people and community messages and phone calls, just trying to process this to the best of my ability. I will share with you that at 3 a.m. Monday morning, he sat up in bed. I thought he was dreaming and I told him to wake up. Wake up. And he didn't respond. 
I thought it was odd he wasn't responding, so I turned the lights on and realized that he was not breathing. I called 911 and immediately started CPR. The ambulance arrived quick, maybe five minutes, and they brought him to our living room and were working on him and took him to the hospital. I then waited for about 30 minutes, which felt like an eternity, with the police. I went to the hospital where I was met by the ER physician, and he took me aside and explained to me that they had worked on him for 40 minutes and just could not bring him back. They think he had V-fib, cardiac arrest. Medical is still pending. Donald was my world. We have two amazing daughters that had the world's number one supporter at their side. He was the best father and husband anyone could dream of having. We just can't believe he is gone. You are welcome to share this information. It's just hard for me at this time to respond back to the hundreds, and I mean hundreds of amazing, loving, and caring people who have reached out. I am blessed, truly blessed for the support and great photos and videos and comments that are so uplifting to our family at this time. If anyone has any questions or needs to talk, feel free to reach out to me. My number is 619-787-1762. We can cry and laugh together. Our address is 87-164 Jillipak, G-I-L-I-P-A-K-E Street. The city, W-A-I-A-N-A-E, Hawaii, zip code 96792. I'm sorry to ramble on, but really want to let the bleeding community and his blood brothers to know that they made such a huge impact in his life and he loved you all. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing those words. Thank you for sharing your great husband to anyone who is interested in reaching out to Lisa. Please do so. She's obviously welcoming it. If you need to laugh, if you need to cry, or if you just want to share some stories, give her a call, write her a letter. I'm sure she would appreciate it. And with that, that is all for this episode. Thank you all for listening. You know where to find us to subscribe, Apple, Spotify, SoundCloud, all the rest. Please share the Bloodstream podcast with others. Thank you, as always, to the full Believe Limited Bloodstream team, as well as to our presenting sponsor, Takeda, bleedingdisorders.com, to learn more about their resources for and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. Mahalo, Ziggy. And listeners, we'll speak to you again next week. Until then. Take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody.